Awareness of the need for real change in the money system is growing. But what direction to take? What exactly is the problem? And how can it be solved? The safest and only real choice, many people argue, is to return to gold, or a gold standard, because this worked for millennia in the past. But gold itself is impractical for transactions in the modern world. It was impractical centuries ago, which is why the promise to pay gold system developed. And so it is certain that, in practice, transactions would be conducted in promises to pay gold, not gold itself. Thus, the promises to pay gold money will only be as reliable as the promises. So in reality, it isn't the gold that makes the system work, it's the reliability of promises. Would they be reliable promises? Maybe. But what we would be using as money would be like the old goldsmith's promises, made in the knowledge that only rarely does anyone ever ask for real gold. This was the problem with the goldsmith's situation. The real gold was seldom claimed, allowing fraudulent promises of gold to be made and used as money. Why would history not repeat itself if all the same elements remained in place? Another thing, what most people say they like about the gold system is that promise of gold money is a promise of a specific amount of real value. Now this is an odd idea, given that the vast majority of us have no use for gold so how much real value can it have for us? Wouldn't a promise redeemable in food, clothing, or shelter be much more real? People also like the idea that gold is just gold, doesn't need a government to create it. However, it does need miners. In a gold money system, mining discoveries, jewelry making, industrial use, hoarding, and counterfeit bars of gold-plated tungsten would all influence the money stock. What on earth does any of that have to do with the need for money for trade? Lastly, gold as money is a single uniform commodity manifesting all the inherent mathematical defects of lending demonstrated in part one of this movie. Being a coin with intrinsic value doesn't make any difference. A lot of gold and silver's appeal comes from a belief in an oversimplified version of history. People assume that coins were invented to standardize the inherent value of the metal they contain. This is true, but right from the beginning, some of the earliest coins were created based on a diametrically opposed idea. This was done because the rulers at that time foresaw the inevitable negative consequences of using limited supplies of precious metals as money. Therefore, they chose to avoid that route. Instead of precious metals, these rulers struck coins of iron or copper and defined their value by decree. What's more, these coins by decree were heated and dipped in vinegar, so the metal they contained would have no intrinsic value. These coins were, in fact, the original and true fiat money. They were merely tokens of value, money created by law and enforced by the ruler's authority. Pure fiat money is the other main idea favored by money reformers. They would restore fiat money to its true status as a national government monopoly on money creation. This current of money reform, in stark contrast to the gold advocates, insists that true money is fiat money by authority of the state. 
This money is to be simply spent into existence as a promise by the state to accept the same money back in payment of taxes. The taxes are compulsory, and the state also promises to enforce the acceptance of this money in court. These are very reliable promises and can result in very reliable money, if not abused. The problem these fiat money reformers have with the current system is that government has given away this power to private bankers and is now borrowing at interest money it could create itself with a few keystrokes just like the banks do. This results in a massive unpayable national debt on which interest will forever be paid. This ever-growing national debt expands the money supply when new money is created by the central bank to buy more government debt. And the interest burden, passed on through taxes, adds to the cost of almost everything we buy one way or another. In contrast to money being created as national debt, fiat money simply spent into existence would save the taxpayers immense sums of interest. It would free future generations from impossible debt, and it would forestall the tendency to inflation because the money supply would not grow forever with the national debt as there would be no national debt. In the fiat money system, taking fiat money out of circulation by means of taxes preserves or restores the value of the remaining money in circulation. Not taxing it back sufficiently would devalue it. Understanding the proper use of government fiat money is a revelation. If you can charge prices or taxes for something in the future, you can issue that much new money now because it is your valuable services to others and the reliability of your promises that create the real value of any money. The government can honor its promises to accept its money back in taxes and it will make your debtors pay you in government fiat money if you take them to court. These are good reasons why government-issued money works now and why it would work if governments just self-issued this credit instead of borrowing it from banks. But in this pure fiat money system, the money supply must still be determined by central authority. Therefore, the money supply is still limited, monopolistic, and managed from above. They have the power to create money and you have to get the money from them. They also have the power to create way too much money and spend it on wars and other unproductive activities without the approval of those whose productivity gives that money its value. In the current system, these inflationary debts are now beyond absurd threatening to crash the entire system and drag the whole world into chaos. To save themselves, governments are now laying impossible claims upon the productivity of generations yet unborn, a truly hopeless cause given the overall world situation. Witnessing government performance to date, many people believe that returning the full power to create money to corrupt incompetent politicians would not only fail to solve our problems, it would be the height of insanity. It would really all depend on the quality of the people in government. Fiat money reformers believe there would have to be a substantial revolution in government to wrest this power back from the banks. Therefore, they believe it would be reasonable to expect that honest and competent people with a sincere concern for the public good would be in charge. But, good guys or bad, we would still be dependent on some distant someone else to maintain the value of our money. And they would have a thousand pressures and temptations to enrich themselves by not doing so. And like gold as money, Government fiat money is a single uniform commodity, manifesting all the inherent mathematical defects of lending at interest and twice-lent money. 
Once the government creates the fiat money and it goes into the banking system to be lent at interest, the problems created in the current system will continue as before. So this pure fiat money idea might be very useful in rescuing governments from their own hopeless financial positions. And it is a limited example of the self-issued credit principle being advocated here. But pure fiat money would not address the root problems inherent in the math of lending, unless the principle were expanded beyond government. Advocates of pure fiat money like to claim it is money created by law, as if it were independent of economics. But if new fiat money were just spent into existence year after year without being removed from circulation as taxes, it would become worthless. What these fiat reformers tend to ignore when quoting history is that in ancient money created by law systems, the prices of critical commodities were also dictated by law. In fact, the value of money was defined by the ruler as so much of a certain commodity. Charge more or less for the designated commodities and it could be off with your head. Today, price controls like this could only be achieved in a self-isolated and totally bureaucratically controlled economy like Soviet communism. In a free market global economy, money created by law is bound by the same laws of supply and demand as any other single uniform commodity money. In other words, pure fiat money in a free market is an illusion. There's no such thing.